Anybody ever get tired of waiting, especially when traveling? Like, does anybody else have trouble driving long distances? Anybody? I have a couple of things working against me when it comes to taking long trips. Number one is I don't sit still very well. And I like to, I like to be able to move. At least knowing that I can get up and walk somewhere helps me if I'm sitting at home for a while, sitting still. But when you're a car, knowing that I have to sit there cramped up for God knows how long, depending on the traffic, doesn't, doesn't feel good. The second thing is, and maybe it's just because I'm getting older, but I have bad knees. Anybody else's knees hurt after you've been driving for a while? And especially in like stop and go traffic, so you're pressing the brake, you're, you're pressing the gas, my knees start to hurt. But, but I'm also, and some of y'all can follow this, but I'm also a, a beat the ETA on the GPS kind of guy. Anybody else take great pride in showing Apple Maps how stupid they are? And so you can, you can, you can buy all of that. And then it, it never fails. Like 30 minutes before our destination, guess what? I got to pee. So I got to pee. I'm tired of sitting still. My knee's hurting. But I got a lot of pride. I'm going to beat that dog on GPS because I've already made up a minute at least. I ain't stopping. And so I kind of move my knee around, kind of wiggle around, just hold it. Because I know when I get to the destination, it's going to feel a lot better. Peter, in the book of First Peter, talks about struggling to a destination. Struggling as he waits to get to a destination. In First Peter, Peter is writing to a group of believers who are under severe persecution from an evil Roman emperor named Nero. And so he begins to outline in the book of First Peter about the persecution and the struggles of life. He talks about how they happen, what's happening, and even why they happen. That even in the struggle and the persecution that God can do something good with it. And he encourages these believers to hold strong to what they believe even though they are enduring something that is beyond their control. Even though they're enduring great pain, he says, don't give up on what you believe. Even though you're suffering, continue to hold to what you've believed. And then in 1 Peter 5, 8, he tells them the source of their persecution. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So he tells them, listen, you have an enemy. You have a very real spiritual enemy, and this enemy is after you because of what you believe. He is out to rob, kill, and destroy, destroy you. He is coming after you, and he doesn't want anything good to come into your life. In other words, you're a believer in Jesus, and he is trying to take you out. This enemy that Peter is speaking to is the devil. It's the devil. The word devil means accuser. And the original readers of this letter would have really resonated with the idea that there's this lion trying to devour them because part of the persecution that they were enduring were literally, they were seeing their family members literally being fed to wild animals as a way of persecuting and punishing them. So when Peter writes, this enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, they would have immediately had a picture of what they meant. Now, I know it's not the same that in 2024 in America, none of us are fearing being fed to wild animals. But don't even today, don't we still face this lion, this enemy in some way? Every person under the sound of my voice this morning has, has felt the attack, the real struggle that comes when the enemy begins to pick on you. Now, he may not be chewing you and spitting you out like a lion, but some of you, you know what it's like to battle this spiritual enemy and to know that Satan is coming after you. Some of you, you know the deep pain of grief, the deep pain of grief that seems to start over 
all the time. When you think you've made strides, when you think it's getting a little further away from you, it comes back. That's the enemy. You know what it's like to struggle through financial pain and financial struggles where you feel like you're finally making some headway and then something takes the savings. Some of you have felt this enemy in your life. You know what it's like to be diagnosed with one thing after another or to watch a family member struggle with one sickness after another. Some of you, you felt this enemy. You know what it's like to be talked about in circles that you thought were supposed to be people that had your back. You know what it's like to take a knife in the back when you thought that they were patting you on the back. Some of you, you've seen what it's like to have Satan attacking your marriage that all of a sudden you don't feel the way you used to feel and there can't seem to be any resolve to the problems you're facing. You all know what it's like when this enemy tries to devour you, when he begins to shred your hope or when he begins gnawing at your integrity or scratching at your self-image. This enemy This enemy that Peter is speaking of, he is a strong enemy. And not only is he a strong enemy, but he also has accomplices. Demons are a real thing, y'all. If you remember, Satan originally was an angel. He was one of God's top angels, but pride got the best of him. And he wanted worship more than he wanted God to have, have worship. And so God kicked him out of heaven. And it's believed that up to a third of the angels went with him and got kicked out of heaven as well. And so now these, these demons, they prowl around, they, they mess in our lives, and they, they cause division in our world, and they try to shred us to pieces. This enemy is, is real, and he wants to take your joy that Jesus so desperately wants you to have. He wants to take your peace that God wants to give you. He wants to destroy your faith. He wants to make you believe what's a lie and doubt the truth. He wants to rob you of your confidence. This enemy is real. Can I make a pastoral plea this morning? Don't mess, don't play around with the enemy. There's this idea of spirituality in our world. And one of the things that I have personally notice, and I think statistics would back this up, is that we don't live in a world that is becoming less spiritual. We live in a world that's becoming less Christian. And people are still after those God-given desires for fulfillment, to feel that, that, to fulfill that spiritual hole in their lives. People aren't afraid of spirituality these days. And because of that, there's become all different options of how we can be fulfilled spiritually. Y'all, Don't mess around with the other options. Don't mess around with the crystals. Don't mess around with the psychics. Don't mess around with cards. Don't mess around with manifestation. Y'all, there is only one answer to your spiritual need. There is only one thing that can fulfill the spiritual desire that God himself put in your soul, and that is Jesus Christ. And if you look for it anywhere else, you will stay miserable, and you will open yourself up to the enemy even more. I'm tired of seeing people dabble. I'm tired of of seeing people search for answers, and what you're doing is you're really speaking to the demons. Another pastoral plea, be careful what you allow into your life. Be careful what your source of entertainment is. Be careful what you allow into your marriage. Be careful what you allow your kids to be entertained by. Y'all, parental controls are okay. Remember, at the end of the day, it's your Xbox, it's your iPad, it's your phone. Set parental controls and don't expose your kids to things they shouldn't be exposed to. Set parental controls and don't expose my kid to things that he shouldn't be exposed to because he's looking at your kid's device. I'm not saying, don't, don't hear me, I'm not angry and I'm not saying burn all your cancel your Netflix account and just watch the Angel Network or just sit around and watch Chosen on 24-7. I am not saying that. But what I am saying is be careful because this enemy is taking down families today. Because what he does is he always offers a counterfeit to what God really has for us. And so what what can happen is we can desire godly things and go after them in an ungodly way. We can desire to have our our spirit 
fulfilled, but go after it in an ungodly way. Do not mess with this enemy. I think what Peter is saying when he says, be sober-minded, is I think he's saying that. He's saying, don't allow things into your mind that are going to take you off track. Don't allow your mind to be flooded with lies or with, with, with a twist of the truth that is going to push you in one direction. He's telling us, focus, focus on the truth. Protect your mind. Guard your mind. Don't search for answers in other places. Set your minds on Jesus himself and the truth that he gives us. Let me ask you a question. Where does your mind go when you don't have anything to think about? Like when you're bored. Some of you are like, I'm never bored. Yeah, but sometimes you lay down at night trying to go to sleep. Or maybe you're driving in your car. Where does your mind wander off to? For a lot of us, I think it probably wanders to the lies we've been told about ourselves that we believe. For some of us, it wonders to how are we going to be able to get out of the mess that we're in? How are we going to be able to control our way out of it? For many of us, I think it wonders to our to-do list, and I have so many things to do, especially at night, right? That's when you can think of all the stuff you got to do the next day. Where does your mind wonder to? I read, okay, I listened to a book. I listened to a book recently by John, John Mark Comer called Practicing the Way, and one of the most impactful parts of that book to me were he makes this, that he throws out this idea that what if you trained your mind to wonder towards the things of God? Like what if you took that anxiety that you normally feel trying to go to sleep at night? What if you took those, those, those down moments in your mind and what if you focused them to things of God? What if you took that anxiety and you used it as a moment to thank God that he's always in control? What if, you, what if you took that thing that you can't see a resolution to and you imagine God in heaven looking down on your life and organizing things in a way that were going to be beneficial for you and were going to be beneficial to his kingdom? What if your mind, in those down moments, began to wonder, W-A-N-D-E-R, I think that's how you spell that, right? Can I get some verification? Okay. Began to wander towards the things of God. It would, it would, it would change our lives. Because the number one place that Satan will attack your life is in your mind. He will speak to you. The Bible says, Jesus himself says that when he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. He will lie to you because if he can get you to think it, and this is why it's so important what you dwell on and what you speak. Because if he can get you to think it, he can get you to replay it in your head. He can get you to speak it out loud. He can get you to believe it in your heart and before, you, before long you are acting on it. Peter says, be sober-minded. Think about what you're, what you're thinking about. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while. I'm thankful that the grace of God comes into play here. Because the verses before don't seem great. There's a lion, there's an enemy prowling, but we have the grace of God. This is important because it reminds me that Satan is prowling, but God is pursuing. It tells me that Satan is coming, but Christ is winning. If you have a relationship with Jesus today, and you have surrendered your life to him, this enemy is on a leash and can only get so far before he runs out of rope. If you have a relationship with Jesus today, 1 Peter tells us that we have the hope of eternal glory in Christ. In other words, what we have to look forward to, the hope that we have, the promise that we have is one day we will be united in present form with our heavenly Father. We will be sitting by his side. We will be standing in his presence. And whatever we go through on this earth will be over, will be done, will be won, will be finalized because of the hope of the glory of Jesus Christ. The enemy is on a leash, y'all. And he only can go so far. Oh, he can attack you. If you let him, he will take your joy. If you let him, he will take your peace. He'll even try to take your life. He'll take your confidence. He'll take your view of yourself, 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 um, 
your self-confidence, but if you're a believer, the victory is not in doubt. Peter reminds these believers, listen, you're undergoing some immense persecution, but you have the hope of eternal glory in Christ. It sounds, sounds great, but I can imagine that Peter's original readers, these people who are being persecuted, they're seeing their family members fed to wild animals are literally lit on fire. I can imagine what they're thinking is, well, that sounds great, Peter, for one day, but what about now? Isn't that what some of y'all are thinking? Like, I can totally get behind being in eternity with Jesus. I can totally get behind that, but what about, what about the hell I'm going through right now? What about, what about the pain that I feel inside of my soul? What about the abandonment I face? What about the abandonment I continue to face? What about the rejection of people that were supposed to love me? What about the abuse that I continue to try to work through even as an adult that happened when I was a child? What about the struggle to pay the bills? What about feeling like I'm an unworthy of anything good because I'm that messed up? What about, what about the divorce I'm going through? What about, what about that? Eternity sounds good and I can get behind that, but what about now? If you're asking that, hold on. Because did you notice how verse 10 ended? It says, after you have suffered a little while. Do you see that thing that comes after a little while? What is that? That's a comma. English lesson. A comma means it's not done. I looked it up on Wikipedia. And a comma is a pause in a sentence or a pause between a list of items. In other words, there's something before it, but it's not a final thought. It's, there's something before it, but it's not done. After you have suffered a little while, we know the suffering part. We get that. Some of us are there today. There's something before it. But look at the rest of verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, comma, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That is the hope that we have today, that the comma is coming, that whatever you're facing right now, Whatever is going on in your mind, in your life, in your body, in your family, in your relationships, that it is the before the comma, and we can have hope, and we can have faith that there is a comma coming, that God is still working, that he has not lifted his hand from your life, that he has not fallen asleep, that he is not dead, that he hasn't forgotten that you exist. You, my friend, every person under the sound of my voice, you need to know today that the comma is coming. Whatever you have, whatever you're dealing with, we serve a faithful God who is not slow in keeping his promises. The comma is coming. Now, Peter is speaking of eternity here. He's telling these persecuted Christians that God's going to grant them eternity and ultimately victory. But also, I believe that's the way God works in our lives. I believe there's a bunch of people sitting here today that need to hear me say that the comma is coming. That I know you're tired. I know you're discouraged. I know you're in pain. I know you're hurting. I know you're wondering why. I know you're scared. I know you're overwhelmed, but listen, listen. God hasn't forgotten you. He's working in ways that you can't see. He's doing things that you can't comprehend. And he's restoring things day by day. How do I know this? I know this personally. Believe it or not, my life isn't perfect. I go through some stuff. I've been through pain. I've been through physical stuff. I've been through relational stuff. And one of the things I know is that the comma always comes. There's something always after it. 
I know this pastorally. Because one of my favorite things to do is to sit and talk with people one-on-one. It still blows my mind why anybody would want to talk to me about their problems because I got some of my own. But I love sitting one-on-one with people and talking through their lives. And over the years, I've heard some incredible, before the commas, I've heard incredible stories of abuse and abandonment and pain and being used and rejection and addiction and bad choices but I've also heard a lot, of, a lot of stories after the comma of how God has saved people, how he's restored things, how he's renewed things. And then I know this scripturally. The Bible is full of stories of people who have endured the comma and seen what happened after. The Bible is full of stories who messed it up so that they had a bad before the comma on their own fault. But God did something after and changed everything about it. What about the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Many of you know that story. Joseph is the favorite of all his brothers. He's Jacob, their father's favorite. They even, Jacob even gives him a fancy coat to show it off. So Joseph has this dream that he should have never told his brothers, but they get jealous and they sell him into slavery. He eventually makes his way to Egypt and gets promoted by Pharaoh. There's a lot of ups and downs between there, but he gets promoted by Pharaoh, and he gets in charge because there's a famine coming. He gets in charge of saving and gathering the food so that they'll have it when the famine comes. Driven by the famine, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt to talk to him to get food from him. How ironic is that? After Jacob, the father, dies, they're scared and During the pinnacle of the story, they fall down before Joseph in Genesis 50, 20. Joseph looks at him and says, you intended to harm me, comma. You intended to harm me, comma, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. In other words, you intended all of this for my evil. You were the enemy. You were the lion in my life. You intended for this to get the best of me, comma, but God used it for something bigger. He used it to save you. He used to save, used it to save a generation, to save a nation. God had a more beautiful story. Now, if you read the story of Joseph, it's over 20 chapters long in the book of Genesis. Homework for this afternoon. I'm just kidding. You don't have to read the whole thing. But it's full of ups and downs. As a matter of fact, the thing will frustrate you because it'll get to a point where it's like, yeah, Joseph is going to win. And then the next time you see him, he's, something bad's happened to him and he's back at the bottom. But it's the story of ups and downs because that's the way our lives go, isn't it? There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. Just because there's a down doesn't mean that God's not still there when, because we give him credit on the ups. And then on the downs, we're like, God, where are you? But life is like that. It's full of ups and downs, but yet through all of that, God is faithful to Joseph. If you're feeling mistreated today, if you're feeling abandoned, if you don't see how good can come from what you're going through, if you don't see any positives in your situation, Joseph's story is a reminder to hold on because the comma is coming. What about the story of how the prophet Samuel would come into the world? Samuel's eventual mother, Hannah, couldn't have any children. During that time, it was seen if you had children, that was a blessing. If you didn't have children, that was a curse. She couldn't have children. Meanwhile, her husband's other wives, whoo, get, get a load of that, husbands. Her husband's other wife had a lot of children. So one day, Hannah is really upset, and she begins to cry out to God. She begins to pray to God, asking for the blessing of God. Eli, the prophet of the time, sees her pray, and he can see her mouth moving, but he doesn't hear any words coming out, and he comes to her, and he's like, are you, are you drunk? Are you crazy? And she says, no, I've, I've actually, I'm, I'm praying for the blessing of God that, that God would open up my womb and that I would be able to have a child. He says, bless you, go in peace. And then, in 1 Samuel 1, 19, it says, the entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, what? 
comma, and in due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. If you feel left out, if you feel like you have nothing good, if you feel like you don't have what other people have, if you feel like you're at the bottom, if you feel the strain of not being enough or not having enough, let Hannah's story remind you that the comma is coming. Want a New Testament example? Matthew 9, starting in verse 27. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, comma, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this, but they went out and blabbed the news to everybody in the region. What do you need healing from today? Is it, is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it a broken heart? Is it a crushed spirit? Hold on. The comma is coming, and the healer is on his way. What about another one? John 6, 16. It says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and what? Comma, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Let me ask you, what are you fearful of today? What? What scares the mess out of you? What can you not see around the corner and you're afraid of what's coming? What storm seems to be flooding your life? What overwhelming circumstance seems to be about to take you out? Let Jesus in the boat. The comma is coming. Let your worry, let your fear push you to prayer and push you to seeking after God rather than doubting that he exists. The comma is coming. And let's do one more. Jesus Christ, the son of God, stepped off his heavenly throne onto dusty earth, born of a virgin in a feeding trough, lived 33 years dies at the hands of men, gets buried in a borrowed tomb. And then, Luke 24, 1, it says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, comma, when they entered, comma. when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. What do you need resurrected today? What relationship do you need resurrected? What hope do you need resurrected? What thing in your life seems like a dead end and you need life breathed back into it? What do you need restored? Because the resurrected one is bringing the comma that you are desiring. No matter what life throws your way, you have the eternal hope of resurrection, resurgence, renewal, and hope. The comma is coming. See, there's, there's always a comma because God is the writer. And only he gets to decide where the period goes. Let me, let me warn you. Don't put a period where God's put a comma. Some of you are close. 
Some of you are close to giving up. You're close to giving up on your life. You're close to giving up on your family. You're close to giving up on your marriage. You're even close to giving up on God. Hold on. The comma is coming. And it's not completed until after the comma. So what's your, what's your trial today? What's your before the comma? What are, you, what are you wrestling with? What are you fighting? What are you feeling? What are, what are you pushing away? What are you holding on to? What, what's before the comma? Because I want us to focus on what comes after the comma. I want us to focus on the faithfulness of God that has gotten you this far, let me remind you. What are, what are you dealing with? There is a comma coming. Are you suffering? There is a comma coming. Are you tempted by the same temptations you thought you had overcome? There is a comma coming. Are you struggling financially? And it seems like every time you make up ground, something else happens. Hold on, a comma is coming. Are you running into roadblocks today? Hold on, a comma is coming. Are you wrestling with your past? what you've been told, what lies you've been, have whispered in your ear. Hold on, there's a comma coming. Are you doubting? There's a comma coming. Are you anxious? There's a comma coming. Are you scared? There's a comma coming. Are you confused? There's a comma coming. Are you overwhelmed? There's a comma coming and we have the eternal hope of a resurrected Savior. There is a comma coming. He is not. there's somebody in the room today that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus and the enemy is after you and his number one goal is to keep you from ever entering into that relationship with Jesus and he's going to tell you lies he's going to tell you you have to be perfect before you do it that you have to get to a certain point that you have to believe it completely and have to know all the details he's going to tell you lies but the Bible says that if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, we will be saved. It's not a perfect belief. It's belief, but it's not a perfect belief. If you need to accept Christ this morning, you can pray this prayer. It's just a confession. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up, but I surrender to you. Everything in my life before has been before the comma, but I can't wait to see what comes after it. So I ask you to come into my life and change me. And I'm going to follow you the best I can for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Wants to do something just a little different, okay? You see, I'm, I, can't, I can't read them all. And you're thinking, thank you. Um, but God knows every single thing that you've listed here. He knows everything that's been on your heart. And so this may feel a little weird to some. And so if, it, if, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But can y'all just kind of stretch your hand out towards me when I start to pray? Don't do it yet. You'll get tired. But when I start to pray, can you just kind of stretch your hands out? Maybe I'll put them here because I don't want it to like you're stretching them out towards me. But... Can we just pray together for each other? Y'all, we're, I can't wait to hear what God does after your comma. Will you please tell me when it finally breaks? Will you please let us know? We're going to celebrate that, okay? If you'll reach your hand towards these cars, I just wanted to pray for them. God, I thank you for every honest person, Lord, that chose to write out a card. And God, the people that were just honest with you, and that, that's totally fine, God. You, you hear their hearts. You know what's on their minds. There's nothing extra special about writing on a card, God. But I do pray for 
for every prayer that's been uttered in this room today. Lord, for the cards that are sitting on this stage, God, I pray that that they would be blown away at your goodness and your faithfulness. God, I don't know what comes after their comma. God, I don't know all the stories. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're lining up. I don't know if you're going to do what they want you to do, if you're going to do something completely different. But what I do know is that you are going to be faithful and you are going to be good to them. I do know that you work all things to the good of those who love you, who've been according, called according to your purpose. I do know that you never leave or forsake us. I do know that you're in the resurrecting, that you're in the healing, that you're in the restoring business. And so God, we ask in Jesus' name that you would captivate people's hearts as they see your faithfulness. And that lives would be changed, that generations would be changed, that families would be changed, that Lord, our city, our towns would be changed because of how we endured till after the comma. God, we trust you. We believe you. We love you. God, I thank you for the amazing opportunity to speak to these amazing people. Holy Spirit, continue to teach us. Do what I can't, but you certainly can. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.